Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you to St. Matthias Church this morning, whether you're joining us online or here in person, and a special welcome if you're new to us, uh, or even newly back, as I look around some people who have come away from long travels. So it's great to be with you. Um, thank you for uh, bearing with, uh, I've, I've got a different sort of name badge, but, um, but uh, thank you for bearing with the process that every six weeks or so, we're um, to sort of stagger the different types of service we go to. We, we're having to have put, we're not having to, are inviting you to put your name on, your, on our badge just to get to know one another better. So we hope that you'll be able to do that over coffee afterwards at the service end. Um, and uh, also just a plug at the end that uh, we'd love to pray with you about anything. So there's a couple of people in the little chapel here to my right after the service will be glad to do that but I just wonder I know you've all just sat down or you or are sitting down um so do you want to just get up and just say hello to someone you don't know uh, and welcome them and just could you just share them anything that you've got to celebrate this week anything you can celebrate this week um with somebody else It's like letting a hundred cats out of a bag. It's fantastic. So, um, can I can I call you back to uh, worship, and uh, we'll carry on those conversations uh, over coffee later. We've got a couple of notices to uh, share with you, um, but I'm first did the formal bit of saying welcome, not just in in my name. Welcome in the name of Christ. God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful chaos. Well, 
As you've looked around this morning, I hope you've noticed, as I have, that this, the place has had an amazing spring clean from sadly a relatively small number of people. But I just want to, can we just give them all a clap? There's about half a dozen people who came and spent all day Saturday clearing up the church for us, ready for Easter and the centre as well. So thank you very much indeed for doing that for us. Um, this evening there's another service at half past five uh, with uh, young people are leading again, so it's great to come along. Hopefully you'll enjoy the worship anyway, uh, but it's a good way of encouraging the young people attached to our church as well, so, or part of our church as well. Uh, so if you can come along at half past five, that would be great this evening. Uh, Monica has something to share with what you might have seen on the way in and what happened here this week, which is good news. Um, probably in the mic here, uh, Monica, thank you. And then a couple of things about... Oh, that's better. <laughs> I'm not getting any taller these days, unfortunately. Anyway, we all know that church is not just for Sundays. Um, so on Thursday, we hosted an event called Experience Easter. And um, it involved two, our two primary schools, uh, Ilsham and Warbury. Uh, we set up five stations linked to Holy Week around the church, Palm Sunday, the Garden of Gethsemane, Washing of the Feet, the Last Supper and the Cross. And the children sort of moved around between each station and experienced the story of each event. Um, uh, the, the last location was about Easter Sunday, and uh, that brought the whole, sto- the whole story of Holy Week together. Um, we found that they were very mature in their emotions and their thoughts. And as John has said, at the back of the church there, Um, the hopes and dreams of some of them are represented on the palm leaves. So do have a look at those because they are very moving. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who helped with that. Uh, Even, you know, people at home who who couldn't participate but remembered us in their prayers. So thank you very much. On their exit, the the children received um, a, a little quiz about Easter and also a chocolate Easter egg. So that made it all worthwhile, I think, as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And yes, do read. The, it's very interesting to, uh, and moving to read the, the children's hopes and dreams for their futures. And uh, today, is, that's part of the Palm Story, Palm Sunday story. And that's what we're trying to engage with together here as we consider uh, the people of Jesus' day and our own hopes and dreams for Jesus and our walk with him together. Just a quick plug, though, about um, the rest next week. So we have a reading through the whole of Mark's Gospel. We've been studying about <clears throat> nearly 50 people have been studying that in the uh, Lent course. So we're reading the whole of Mark's Gospel up until the Garden of Gethsemane on, um, East, on Maundy Thursday. That's starting at 7. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul Barton has assembled a great team of readers uh, and in, just reminds you, please, could you just gather... Where did you want people to go, Paul? Sorry, in the south, what we call South Transept here. Uh, pick up a coffee and then go and uh, have a chat just to work out how that can work in a streamlined way. Uh, so we're running... It's going to probably take until about nine. We'll have a, a comfort break halfway through and, and we'll be sharing bread and wine almost at the same way in a similar sort of point of the reading as we read through Mark's Gospel. And then we pick up the... Um, awful story in every aspect of that word uh, on Good Friday morning at 10, so we're going to read the rest of the parts of the crucifixion uh, account from St. Mark at 10 o'clock at an on-all-age service here on Good Friday, and then um, giving time either to stay behind for hot cross buns and coffee uh, or to go and join the Walk of Witness in town with the churches together. And There's details on the notice sheets that you can see online or you might should have been given today as well. Um, and then there's also a reflective sort of at the foot of the cross uh, service at two o'clock till three on Good Friday, before then returning on Sunday morning at eight and eleven for our main services. Then for Easter morning, um, we've found it quite fun uh, as a way of on Easter morning of wearing something white. If you've got anything, don't please don't, like that and buy anything. But um, if you've got any white, gold, or yellow, just to wear, just to add to that sort of sense of celebration on Easter morning, that would be good fun to do as well. Go back in time a week, really, from Easter uh, Day, and we are joining uh, Jesus and his friends as they come into Jerusalem for Jesus' final week before the events of the Easter weekend. I wanted us to start by having a sort of a 
merging together as best we can some of the words of Psalm 118, which the crowds, as we know, would have shouted as, as they came in for their Passover festival um, in praise and jubilation, but also have very particular uh, resonance with what was happening with Jesus coming in as well. Then we're going to sing a song, Hosanna, and then Monica is going to read us the gospel account from Mark, again, of that Palm Sunday, and then we're going to a second song. So if you're comfortable to do so, you might like to stay standing for the psalm and stay standing all the way through, because it's sort of all of a piece, but not all of us can stay standing for that long. So please just feel perfectly comfortable to sit down whenever you need to, um, but if we see how we get on with that first section of our service. So uh, if we could just have the first slide up. Um, Good to do this is sort of two part two halves of the of the children, two part two halves of the of the church as we sort of imagine we're different parts of the crowd. So perhaps if this side on where I am now could start off with those bold, uh, straightforward type, and in the italics could you start off and perhaps the singers could lead in the second half of that, and then the last verse we will join in together. But before we do all that, because it's quite a sort of huge piece of uh, scripture and song to get together, should we just be quiet for a moment and just maybe you might want to share with the Lord your hopes and dreams. Uh, for your life, for the life of this church, for the life of the world. And uh, let's ask God by his Holy Spirit to move among us this morning. So I can invite you to stand as we start off our service in praise of our Lord. So shall we all stand and I'll start us off with this first part of the psalm. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut from the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Thanks be to God. Do take a seat as we're going to look at that reading together from Mark's Gospel, which is on your service sheets. I know you're juggling palm crosses as well, um, so we'll be using those just in a closing prayer at the end of a service. So, and if you, for some reason, didn't get given one, please just uh, I'll wave at some point, or somebody will bring you one as gladly so, uh, when we come to that. Well, it's been... Um, it's quite a sobering week in some ways, and quite sad actually to see how the press in particular has dealt with the sad news um, about the Princess of Wales, isn't it? And um, quite an interesting reflection on how we uh, treat royalty these days indeed. But um, when I hear of crowds spreading cloaks before a king, I tend to conjure up an image of Sir Francis Drake. Not that I was there in 15, whatever it was, um, doing just that before Queen Elizabeth as she stepped 
as uh, he stepped off the golden hind moored on the south bank uh, as a sign of uh, loyalty and uh, respect and perhaps love of the queen, his queen. But actually, it's got a mu- that business of spreading cloaks has a much longer history. Way back in the Old Testament, in 2 Kings chapter 9, in the 9th century BC, we, when King James, Kim Je- um, where are we? Who was it? Jehu, sorry, it was, who was anointed and proclaimed king of Israel. Um, we read this um, They hurried and took their cloaks and spread their cloaks on the road. Uh, on, on the bare steps, sorry, is the quote. And on Palm Sunday, it's interesting. The, the crowds around Jesus would have known that, which is why they followed suit and spread their cloaks on the road before Jesus the King. But there's another passage from the Old Testament that they would have also known this time, this time, um, uh, at that time, uh, this time a prophecy, a really important prophecy from uh, Zechariah chapter 9, which Mark uh, quotes for us. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And actually, if you read on through that prophecy, this, the rest of it is really an encouragement for us to carries on. He will proclaim peace to the nations. How much we need that right now. And Jesus, of course, would have known that prophecy as well. And even though the crowds were in a quite an excited mood anyway, coming to Jerusalem for the Passover festival, it wasn't usual for anyone to ride into Jerusalem, in certainly not in quite in that style. Now, I don't know about you, but in previous years, um, I've seen his choice, Jesus' choice of a donkey as simple of a, a symbol of his own humility. Um, you know, choosing to come on a donkey rather than a great white charger or in a gold coach or anything. And at one level, it is that, as, the, as Zechariah prophecy says, the king is to arrive as one who is righteous, having salvation, and who is gentle. And it's completely in keeping with the upside-down nature of Jesus' own understanding of greatness in God's eyes. If we read some of the previous chapter, in chapter 10 of St. Mark, um, he explains to the rather disappointed uh, mother and uh, two shocked brothers of James and John when they ask for the top seats in glory uh, either side of Jesus. And this is how he replies to them. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, Jesus is a sort of name for himself uh, in some ways linked to prophecy in Daniel, of course, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So there is this just straightforward symbol of humility, but at another deeper and more essential foundational level, Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey is a very public declaration of who he is to all who would see it. Yes, to his followers, but, and perhaps particularly, but perhaps particularly to the religious leaders uh, of that he was coming into Jerusalem, and St. Mark specifically tells us he's coming into the temple in Jerusalem, knowing and declaring exactly who he was. He was declaring, I am the Christ, the Messiah, God's anointed king. And I find this self-assurance and authority of Jesus one of the most extraordinary things about him, don't you, when you read about him? One point, one sort of, one that points so clearly to the authenticity of his claim, in fact. Imagine that amazing, um, the way in which um, the owner of the donkey and Jesus' disciples just followed those slightly odd instructions about collecting a donkey in the first place, and yet they did it, and the owner let him have it. There's something about the authority of Jesus. A few chapters later in Mark's account, Jesus accepts a year's worth of perfume poured over his feet at a home in Bethany as a perfectly legitimate and reasonable gift. He's perfectly content here to accept the adulation of the crowd with St. Luke adding his remarks to the Pharisees who told him to quieten his disciples. If you remember, if my disciples keep quiet, the very stones will cry out. 
No wonder, perhaps, that no one dared directly stop him when the next day he starts clearing the temple, when the people have seemed to have forgotten the main purpose of that building, to offer prayer and worship to God and to meet him, the almighty God, there. You may remember that Jesus goes on to explain that he himself was the very person through whom we might weep with God, the new temple, and dwell with, abide in, as Jesus puts it in John's Gospel, with that provocative and mysterious comment, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Andrew Green, in the last week of the Lent course, helpfully reminded us of how the temple is one of those core themes of the last chapters of St. Mark's Gospel, noting also how the temple of the the curtain of the temple, which kept people away from the most holy place where God, when people met with God, was torn in two from top to bottom at the moment of his death. Andrew also reminded us of how massive the theme of Mark, in Mark is of Jesus being the anointed king. Indeed, throughout the whole of the Old Testament, the Messiah, Messiah is promised to be of King David's lineage. And even blind Bartimaeus, in a few verses earlier, reminded everyone of that, declaring, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, before he joined Jesus, now as seeing Bartimaeus, on the way to Jerusalem a few verses earlier. No wonder the crowd were more excited than usual. Though I'm not sure everyone really understood quite what all this meant. What does it really mean? What did it really mean for Jesus coming as king? And as this sort of king? And as I'm going to share with some words from Tom Wright to close, I'm not sure we do really either. So the Jewish people then, as they gathered to celebrate the Passover festival, were longing for freedom once more, this time from Roman occupation. And it seems that actually they then as now, actually whether Israeli or Palestinian or any other warring party for that matter, assumes that the only way to gain peace and security in your land is by force, at the direction of a powerful leader. And so when they see Jesus as the powerful prophet and healer and teacher declaring himself in this way to be king, they are filled with hope and praise. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. I wonder whether they'd forgotten. Had they, do we forget that Jesus had always talked and lived out his teaching that God's kingdom comes not through war and conquest, but through the tough process of loving our neighbours, even our enemies. It involves forgiveness and service and reconciliation and sacrifice. Nevertheless, as his last week uh, before the cross progressed, we see how the Roman authorities were spooked by the threat of a potential rival king, however unlikely he might appear. And we also see how the Jewish leaders uh, were keen to halt any idea at all that this itinerant teacher and healer from backwater Nazareth who spent his time with undesirables could ever be God's Messiah, King, and so consider his claim to be blasphemous and so worthy of death. And as the week progresses, and Andrew helped us so much last week at Lent Course to see the huge irony played out, Jesus remarkably passive in his passion, leading him to be crucified as if cursed by God, would make them think they were right in their judgment. But we know how wrong they were. And at the resurrection day confirmed that, for king he was and king he is. And I wanted to leave you with these really challenging words from Tom Wright. I'm afraid they just challenged me so much. I don't normally, it's the sort of thing a preacher actually can't say themselves because it affects me as much as it affects you. But I'll just leave you with this challenge and a comment at the end. This is not, this is Tom Wright, this is not to be the sort of royalty that either Israel or the rest of the world were used to. But the passage already raises questions for us in our own following of Jesus and loyalty to him. Are we ready to put our property at his disposal? 
to obey his orders even when they puzzle us? Are we ready to go out of our way to honour him, finding in our own lives the equivalents of cloaks to spread on the road before him and branches to wave to make his coming a festival? Or have we so domesticated and trivialised our Christian commitment, our devotion to Jesus himself, that we look on him simply as someone to help us through the various things we want to do anyway, someone to provide us with comforting religious experiences. In our world where most countries don't have kings and queens, and where those monarchies that remain are mostly constitutional offices with the real power lying elsewhere, have we forgotten what, in biblical terms, a true king might be like? So this morning, we're encouraged, and I encourage you to offer our lives afresh, or maybe even for the first time, to the service of Jesus, our King and Lord. But as we do that, I thank God, and I want you to thank God, that he is righteous and gentle with us. And he leads, a king who leads by example, by first loving and serving us with his death on the cross among those which obviously the main thing which enables our forgiveness to be set free for a new future at his service So I invite you to join me with a confession prayer. Uh, The words are on the screen. I think we'll probably stay sat down and then at the end of this stand to sing King of Kings. So on Palm Sunday, the crowds delighted in Jesus. Hosanna, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. On Good Friday, they shouted, crucify him. Let us who worship him today confess that we sometimes reject him and ask his forgiveness. Lord Jesus, you come to us in peace, but we shut the door of our hearts against you. Lord, have mercy. You come to us in humility, but we prefer our own proud ways. Christ, have mercy. You come to us as king, but we will not have you reign over us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, come to us this day. Forgive our empty praise. Fill our loveless hearts and direct our lawless wills now and always. Amen. Shall we stand stand to sing, King of Kings, Majesty. Right.
ransom souls brought the sinner near to your throne all within me cries out in praise your majesty Please take a seat, and Marilyn, Marilyn's going to lead us in our time of prayer. When I say, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, please respond, his love endures forever. Heavenly Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your enduring love. You sent your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so that we might be saved from our sin. King of kings though he was, he humbled himself and rode into Jerusalem on a colt. May we too show humility and servanthood. We pray, Lord, that the seeds that you have sown in us may take root and bear the fruit of your Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you washed the feet of your disciples, showing your service to others, so that we too might follow in your footsteps. We pray for all those who care for others and ask your blessing upon them. Our ministers and all who serve here in our church, for doctors and nurses who tend to the ill and dying across the world, for charitable volunteers who provide food and clothing to those in dire circumstances. Open our eyes and our hearts, Lord, so that we too may recognize those in need and give generously of our time, our money, and our skills. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Lord Jesus, the Sunday on which you entered Jerusalem and followers spread cloaks and palm leaves beneath the feet of the donkey you rode would have been your last on earth before you were arrested, tried, and sent to death. We acknowledge the fear and distress you experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane as you contemplated what lay ahead. We lift to you now all those who face similar circumstances in wars around the world, children dying of starvation, the destruction and death in Gaza, Sudan, Yemen, Ukraine, and elsewhere. We pray now, Lord, that those who suffer in this way will know your loving arms around them, that you will let aid into Gaza and bring an end to these wars, that you will bring repentance to the perpetrators and peace for all. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Holy Spirit, impart your wisdom and respect to all parliamentarians 
and particularly to our government, that they might serve our nation with integrity. We think particularly of the situation with illegal immigration, the shortage of employees, those suffering homelessness and poverty. Fill all those who make our laws with the cognitive ability to address these faults and to restore peace and justice according to your desires. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. We pray now for Kate, Princess of Wales, and her family, that her cancer will be healed and that she will know the love and support of many. We pray likewise for King Charles. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And now we pray, Lord, for those in our church family who are ill. Angela Burt, Tom Fish, Sarah Smith, Archie, a child, Mike Blunson, Angela Newman, and Lorraine Myrie. Heavenly Father, let them know your healing hand upon them, your loving arms around them, your peace in their hearts and minds. We pray too for those who have lost loved ones, the family of Keith Girling. And in a moment of silence, we lift to you those known only to ourselves. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Pass our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Well, we're coming towards the close of our service. Um, you might want to find, discover your, or dig out your palm cross, because uh, we're going to use that for the closing prayer. Um, just a reminder to stay, do stay for coffee and for prayer if you'd like some prayer. I'm going to close with might be a slightly provocative way. I'm going to hear from the, 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 the singers that are going to lead us in three ref short reflections of some of the people who might have been in that crowd on Palm Sunday as we try to make sense of the. the change between that uh, welcome of Jesus the King uh, leading to his crucifixion. And uh, then we're going to go straight into uh, singing our closing hymn, Ride On, Ride On. So perhaps if we stay sat for these short reflections um, and uh, then stand with our announcement for the for closing hymn. So first we're going to hear uh, from a farmer who might have been in the crowd or reflecting on Jesus uh, as he's met him through the years. David. You have it coming to you. You cannot traipse around the country and with a dozen vagrants, some of whom can't speak properly and expect to be believed. Your disciples, if you can call them that, are common. And you, with your stories of lost coins and runaway children, are far from sophisticated. People want a messiah, not a former tradesman. If you pretend to be one, but are the other, you must take the consequences. Then we hear from a worshipper in the temple. You have it coming to you. You're taking God into the marketplace without permission. You sit with the unemployed and pretend that God is there. You kneel down beside a whore and pretend 
that God is there. You smile at soldiers, heathen soldiers, and pretend that God is there. You cannot do this to God. You cannot take him where you want to go. Worse still, you cannot say that he is there already, unless, of course, you don't believe in the God we believe in, in which case we have nothing to learn but plenty to teach you. And finally, from one of the Pharisees, perhaps. for poking fun at what is serious in politics and religion. But there is a borderline between jest and indiscretion, which you obviously don't recognize. Riding on a donkey with your starry-eyed friends, throwing the shirts off their backs in front of you and doing this in royal style. That may be quite a laugh after dark when the streets are empty apart from drunken men. But not, not in the light of day, in the most sacred week of the year. Those who do that must be prepared for the consequences. <laughs> you might want to join me in praying together. True and, sorry, wait till the words to go. Keith, thank you. True and humble Messiah and King, grant us the faith to know you and love you, that we may be found beside you on the way of the cross, which is the path of glory. Amen.